Hi, Ron. Hi, Oscar. Thanks for coming to the uh, to the, to Barcelona. It's my pleasure. So, um, how do you think the class went? Ah, I thought the class was really great. There are some really good students, and uh, I think that they're tackling some big problems. Uh, and I think that that's good to see. And I think that uh, you know it's uh, it's healthy for design to have that kind of ambition. I really like when you were talking about like design always implies an intervention. Yeah. What do you mean by that? So can you maybe explain it a bit more? Yeah, so I like to think that we, you know, I think we tend to always think that we're motivated, people are motivated to have new designs or have things in the world. But I don't think that's always the case. I think people are very, you know, they're busy about going about their lives, but also they have practices and they're really establishing what works for them, what doesn't work for them. They're tackling ideas of their well-being and what they think are fair and all of these other things that every time we come along with something like a design, no matter what it is, is asking on some level for change. Um, and I think some people are motivated for change, but others are not. It really depends on what it is. So in each and every case, it's something to at least pause and think about. And it's something that is going to ask that whatever you're doing today, you may want to do differently tomorrow. Yeah, so I think in a way it's really important to understand that this change can happen at different levels. Yeah. So it could be with the use of an object, but could also be in the process of designing it or the, or the associated practices to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's really the t t tough part for a lot of designers, and I think also for this class, was how do you ground whatever the problem is? For whom are you designing? What is the context? in which you're designing, so not all interventions are the same. And then, of course, you know, you're know you always cons you're always considering perhaps what are the unintended consequences of what you're doing, but I think design comes with some risk, it should come with risk, and I think that the idea that you um, can kind of uh, uh, think about for whom you're designing and, and situate it in that context is one way to help manage some of that risk. Yeah, so uh, in a way I think that like risk is an important factor, especially when yeah. you're designing for the unknown, you're designing for the future in mm -hmm. a way and the only way to uh, learn about if it's interesting or if it could be meaningful for, so for society is by trying it out. Yeah and as we were talking about I think sometimes you have to, you have to take the risk that perhaps you will have no impact um, and I think even to some degree you have to take the risk that maybe your impact obviously is not what you thought it would be because the chances are that's what's going to be um, but the, the risk may not be at all positive it could be negative but I think that's part of the risk and I think that the idea in design, since it's such a complex process and an open process, and I think it's one that involves more than the designer, involves the stakeholders, involves a lot of, as I'm going to talk about later, a lot of non-human things like materials and other technologies, that in fact, you know, you have to kind of, in order to incorporate that or, or I guess embrace it, you have to do that, you have to take on some risk. Yeah, and the thing I would say that you either take the risk to, uh, to realize that what you're trying to do might not be meaningful for society, but you better know it, then pretend it is meaningful and continue working with your eyes closed. Yeah, I think so. I think we have a tendency, or some have a tendency, to think in terms of solutions and sort of a certain kind of solutionism. And they want what the, their, their idea or the thing that motivates them to have a ready solution. But I think there's not enough of staying with the problem. Understanding what the problem is is, is again, it's contradictory, it's complex, and it's your view, it's your agenda on the problem. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the problem. But I don't, think peop I don't think designers stay enough with it. And I think in some sense that we perhaps design from a weaker position than we really should be doing. And, and do you think that this post-human approach to design could be a solution? Well, maybe yeah. solution is the wrong <laughs> word, but uh, could be an opportunity for that? Well, I think we have enough challenges and we're certainly surrounded by them now. And I think that, that, that in many, at least we have to take stock and think to what degree the way we have been designing is part of the problem. And so to what degree, do we have, how far can we go with human-centered design, despite how much is actually produced for us and how much good in some level it's created. But what are some of the challenges with that? And I think the issue with post-humanism is at least this idea that it rethinks, I think it positions you where you have to design with others, you think with others. So whether you're thinking with others, other humans as, 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 as not yourself, as not the same, as diff different from you, you're thinking about non-humans in terms of other animals and other species, you're thinking about matter, you're thinking about you're designing with others that co-inhabit the same place and the same neighborhood, the same planet that you do. Uh, and so in that way, I think, it, I think the, at least the framing of it um, brings to the foreground uh, a way of thinking that gets beyond our narrow privileging of, human, of exclusively human values. And do you think it's going to be easy to uh, make the shift into yeah. post-human design? 
I don't think it will be easy at all, but I think there's enough urgency, and I think I'm, in, uh, you know, first, no, I don't think it's easy, and I don't know what, and I think that, that I, I, I uh, and I don't really know what that shift is going to be, or what it should be, or it's going to come up in multiple forms and a certain multiplicity, which is good. Um, I, I think that the, 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 the challenge is that I, you know, I think we, there's a certain urgency now. Um, I think we, you know, we have to, to, if we're not willing to take stock and put ourselves, see ourselves as potentially being part of the problem, and by that I mean the way in which we design, then I think we have less hope. I mean, I think that that's less, that that's not a viable position anymore. Because mm. yeah. even in the master program, we try to teach the students how design can happen from society for mm -hmm. society, yeah. from a bottom-up perspective. Yeah. But still, like the comments and questions that we get, it's like, but I need to know first what's yes. possible. Yes. Or the other thing is like, how can I validate yeah. that what I'm doing is right? Yes. Yeah, and I think that the, so again, so if we talk about it in the sort of post-human context and some of the thinking and some of the, for example, around post-humanism, I think informed by perspectives that say like feminism or, or, or other perspectives that, for example, there's an idea of situated knowing. Uh, and so I think you know within the given situation. And I think we also have to be able to design from not knowing. And I think the idea that perhaps if you want to be inclusive of, let's say, non-human animals, you want to be inclusive of, of materials or other non-human things like machines and technologies, there's a real limit to how much we can know about these things. They're simply not human. I mean, our ability to understand things is based on the fact of who we are, our, the sense that we are humans in this world. So I think that in, that that I'm beginning to rethink design from a position of not knowing and being able to design in a way that we can think about knowing from a situated perspective and from our perspective I think is a much better start and I think a much better grounding. And do you think that taking this kind of a human approach to design actually will make the design process more human and personal? I think so. I think that one of the things that we lack, I think we want to, we aspire to a certain kind of human a, a relation to the world, which I think is is again part of the problem. I think if we can, if we understood this in a much broader context, we'd have much more humility. And I think humility is something that's really lacking in, in in the way in which we go about designing. Which is not to say you don't have ambition, but you have there's a certain understanding of I think the limits of what your abilities are, and the fact that those abilities and the outcomes of those abilities are shared with others. And I, I think that is uh, uh, yeah. So in a way, design can change the world by step by step. <laughs> well, I think we would always like to think that it's, I think design always changes the world. I think the question is to what degree, um, uh, to what degree we, we, we change the world with an understanding of the, how that, the outcome of that world, that world that we're going to co-inhabit. I mean, I think that's, that's the challenge. I think we're always changing the world. We have changed the world dramatically. We've changed the world dramatically based on you know, whether our, our values around what we believe to be convenient or our values about what we want to consume or our values about accumulating wealth. Um, and that's been rampant. And I think that the thing is, is we will continue to change the world, but I think we have to reassess uh, the, the, the privileging of certain values and make way for other values. Cool. Well, yeah. thank you very much for your time. And You're thank welcome. you for being here. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me, Oscar.